tonight we get started to know that um, some of our selectmen need to um, leave for selectmen meeting tonight, so we want to let them get in as much time as they can. Uh, so welcome to our series here for primary priorities. This is a series of community conversations that we're having across um, our elementary schools to help educate and engage the community conversations around um, the state of our schools and our path forward in terms of what we want to do uh, to enhance our learning spaces for our students. So I'm Dr. Gossens from Community Schools. I'll be presenting today along with um, Mr. O'Leary, John O'Leary, he's our director of facilities. Um, we also have Dr. Rue, our principal, um, as well joining us. And our agenda tonight, we're gonna to start with an overview of Burnham, uh, share some of the facility challenges that the school faces right now, um, have an opportunity for feedback and questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So, again, this is an opportunity for us to come together. This isn't a debate. Um, this isn't a, a time to come out and argue um, or say, oh, we heard all these things in the past. This is really an opportunity for us to just say, here's what we know about the schools right now, um, and let's start, engage, let's start a conversation moving forward in terms of what we're going to do uh, to help solve some of these problems. So just before we get started, um, get a sense of who's in the audience tonight. Um, so when I offer a description that describes who you are, uh, please just raise your hand and signify uh, that that's a fitting term for you. So uh, how many folks here tonight are parents? All right, nice parents right now. Um, members of the community and uh, teachers. <laughs> um, how about school board members? All right. So we have a good sense of who's in the room tonight. Thanks, guys. Um, and I said our goal is to come together as a community uh, and have a conversation. So here's some facts about Burnham. Um, the Burnham School currently serves grades K to five. We have 74 students total. 54 of those come from Bridgewater, and we have 20 students um, as of Monday who tuition into the school. Um, as you know, Burnham has a strong reputation for um, excellent outcomes. It consistently scores above state norms. We have um, this building itself, well, all the buildings together uh, on this property, uh, comprise about 16,000 square feet, and overall, um, the building sits on a roughly three acre parcel of land. Uh, this original building for the school was built in 1927. Um, it was a split level building with an upstairs and downstairs. Um, in addition to that original building, a second building was built um, that was about 7,500 square feet, effectively doubling the size of the school uh, back in the 60s. In 1989, um, many of our schools across the district underwent significant renovations. Um, Burnham was one of those schools. Um, and at that time, um, a lot of the work was done to address uh, the systems. So uh, power, lighting, heating were all upgraded. Um, also worked to help um, make the building better resistant to fire, so separations were upgraded uh, and a fire stair hall was created. At that point, the elevator was also installed to uh, allow ADA accessibility for students with mobility issues. Um, in 2002, um, a capital needs assessment was <coughs> undergone by a, an architect and um, Looking back at the um, recommendations from that report, um, some of the recommendations were implemented, uh, many were not. Um, as of right now, there's no building permit information um, in the assessor's office, um, but the condition and appearance of the buildings, uh, interiors and finishes, um, has left no record that talks about what's been done there um, in addition to that report agreed in 2002. Um, but, it does appear to indicate that significant additional work has been performed on an ongoing basis uh, by the facilities manager. Uh, that was from our latest architect's report um, that we shared recently. And since that 2002 report, um, a couple of other uh, <clears throat> sections of the building were addressed. So the flat sections of the roofs were replaced back in 2009, and then the pitched roof um, areas were replaced in uh, 2022. The building has served, um, the water comes from a deep well um, with a pump system and expansion of ladder tanks. Power comes to us um, via Connecticut Lake Power um, through overhead lines and then we go on the ground before it enters the building. Storm water is collected um, from the roof, discharged dry wells, um, and then it's either discharged to um, dry wells or um, to surface runoff. And then the sanitary waste in the building um, is pumped out to a septic tank um, and then the F1 is dispersed in the leaching field. 
So this brings us to some of the concerns for the built the facility here. Um, and this building, like many buildings and many human engineering feats, um, go back to almost the beginning of time. So here's a drawing uh, from Van Gogh, where Van Gogh was trying to build a perpetual motion machine. Uh, and this problem frustrated him because he said, on paper, this works great, this should work, I don't understand this, I can never build this thing in real life. Um, and he spent much of his, um, his working time trying to um, perfect this to no avail. So we know that from antiquity on that nothing lasts forever and ever the best machines. And so we're here to talk about some of our machines and some of our building systems here tonight. Um, when we talk about those, we kind of bundle them into four areas of need. So the systems, um, structure, architectural features of the building, and then um, hazards that are present in the building um, due to uh, some of the materials that we've used over time. Uh, and then we'll have an open dialogue, we'll have a feedback and question opportunity. Um, but at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Don to walk us through um, some of the areas we'd like to bring to attention of the other community in terms of some of these in the building. Uh, we have some pictures here so that you have a chance to kind of see uh, up close and personal some things you don't see when you walk through the schools. Um, when you walk at all our schools, I think they look great. Uh, if you come here for plays or events, um, the space is attractive, the classrooms look amazing, the teachers do a great job. But there's a few things behind the scenes that um, are always apparent and we want to make sure that we're being transparent and educating the community about what some of the investments that we'll have to make to um, our building in the next few years to bring some of these things back up to uh, proper conditions. So Don, why don't you walk us through your presentation? Uh, I think we're going to start with the mechanical systems. Okay. So um, above that, I put a statement. And uh, I put that there just to clarify why we're here. Um, the, the statement is additional improvements to the district's elementary schools in the areas of air quality, reliable mechanical maintenance, cost, and, and energy efficiencies are being hindered by the need to address the mechanical equipment and the building design capabilities and the existence of hazards that exist. So what I mean by that is um, the building, like, like Mark said, the buildings are clean, and right now they are running to their design specs. Uh, those design specs, is, as he showed you, were last updated in 1990. And, and so the, the real issue is that the difficulty in moving forward to make additional improvements to the school are being hindered by things that are hazards, asbestos, lead paint, um, lead and copper, pipes for water, um, the, the mechanical systems being of an age where they won't support what today's needs are. And so what I've done here is to show some pictures throughout the school just to show that, um, to show that story or tell that story. We'll start with the boilers. Now these two, particular boilers have been here since the 1990 upgrade and they work fine but the, the system as a whole doesn't act together as you know there's window air conditioners etc there's very little filtered air and we'll get to each of those um, the, these um, let's see we're out. Uh, hot water heating in our schools so we those boilers pump hot water to the classrooms and there's there's a number of, and there, here's some pipes that, that are running on our ceilings, um, on us bust this laden ceilings, to, uh, to get to their destination. Uh, they're, they're going to heating um, circulators and pumps that pump them through the building. Here's a couple of them. The, what's happening here is these, these pieces of equipment are failing one at a time here and there, and we're, we're constantly having to to come in and, and upgrade them. You'll see some of those pictures as we go. Um, let's see, some circulators. You can see we've, we've introduced a, a new one here. Um, that, that little red circulator and that little red pump together cost about $4,000. <laughs> just just <clears throat> one of those. Um, now that's a specific type, it's a Bellagazzi. <laughs> Well, the pump is good. See the red, we've attached the gold motor to a red pump. The pump is good, but the motor failed. So in an effort to save money, um, we search for an alternative. Um, as you see, we've 
changed from one style to another and went from quite a few thousands to eight hundred dollars. But the, that's not the issue. The issue is, you know, we need to we need to we need to upgrade the systems entirely. Right now, we're just keeping them going to their design specs. What you're seeing here, this building has a, a series of various heating implements. The boilers provide hot water and send it out to unit heaters on the walls. And in this particular instance, behind that backboard right there, there's a concrete mezzanine above that hallway. And this equipment is above that hallway, above that block there. And it was all redone in 1990 also, but it, 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 it's difficult to see, but you can see the motorized valves up there that we've added and, and some of our, our repairs. Um, I have had these systems cleaned. I've had people go in here and clean the dust out of here uh, a couple of times since I've been here. Um, right now they're operating. However, they're not providing what we need. Here's some more pictures of these particular components that make up this system, um, these being valves. Um, again, you can see where we've been in there doing our handiwork. And, and you know, we've got fire systems up there. And we've got fire systems under here, too. Um, this school doesn't have a sprinkler system in it. The state of Connecticut recommends it, but doesn't require it. So what you're looking at here is, is the backside of the boiler room. And one of the things I didn't put in my, in my handout was that right there is a sewer ejector. And we're going to talk about the waste pipes in a little while. But the reason that's there is because it's, the, it's, it's, the lowest, it's lower than the pipes are. So the sewage needs to be pumped up and out of the school. That's a 1990s component also. Um, <coughs> So I told you that the, the hot water went to various places, one of which is up in that mezzanine. That, that system is a forced hot air system. So the water goes through a set of coils and then air is blown across the coils and through ductwork. This, this is the incoming mover here that's actually the exterior of the building. Uh, and notice the filter bank is over here. So there's various ductwork and other pieces of equipment in, in the way, and if you, if you can't, it doesn't do it justice, but that, that component right there and that one there are back in the 80s time frame. Um, but it's all working. More distribution. These, the, which, what I'm trying to show you is the various, <laughs> this, this is in the back side of the boiler room. This is the custodial, that's, that's the custodial desk. That's, that's a, a room between the elevator, mechanical room, the boiler room here. And that little door right there is an access to a crawl space underneath the building here for the dirt floor. And notice, notice the ductwork, you know, going through that space. Um, th this, these are pictures of various um, aged pieces of equipment. Uh, bus, this, this is a, a fan motor. Um, blowing, blowing air back into another space. You know, it's it's just we're on top of this stuff, but um, there's 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 very few of us to do this, and and we're we're just spending money. It's unreliable. The, the amounts of money that we're spending is hard to predict, also, uh, because the, the systems are a little unreliable because they're at their end of their life expectancy. Just refused. The bearing has seized. That was the picture. So this piece of equipment, that, oh, give it a try. Oh, there you go. That, that little pillow block bearing right there. So um, over in WPS, there's a blower motor. It's just about my eye level. It's pretty, pretty big around, maybe five and a half feet around. And it's got an 11 foot shaft. It's two inches, uh, two and three sixths thick. And we just replaced that bearing. Um, it was put in in 1990 over there too. And 
what a bear it was. It, it cost us about 1100 bucks, but while it was down, it was down. The gym was cold. The, the two rooms on either side of it were cold. Uh, one of my HVAC guys says, no heat, no school. You know, we're doing everything we can to keep them going. These are various wall units that are in the classrooms. This particular one and a couple others uh, notice how it's encased underneath it. It, it typically, it's got a blower in it that blows hot air across the top. The thermostats aren't working in there, so we've had to add additional thermostats and, and um, various fan motors. And it's got very, very little filtration in it at all, if any. So it's just basically taking a hot water and coil and blowing air across it and pushing it out into the room. A couple of these downstairs, and, and you may see it in the next ones, um, actually were connected originally to the outside air, but they no longer work, um, like this one. So, I didn't notice. So the back of this is actually a box, a, a, a plenum, a, a, an empty box of metal. That's, that's going to the exterior. And it's supposed to allow air to come from the outside in, get heated, and then distribute it in. But that part was disabled. I've been here 15 years and it was disabled when I got here, the, the outside air part. So right now it just serves as a heater. A couple of times through the years when we had single di digit temperatures for a couple few days a week at a time, um, I've had to go in those classrooms. It was mostly through the, the last time it was during the Christmas break. And I had to literally put heaters in that classroom because the, the coils inside there, although they got hot water in them, they're, they're exposed to the air that's inside that box, which I can't get to and we can't insulate. Um, so we didn't want them to freeze. Um, there, let's see, where are we? Um, uh, these are, I told you about the incoming air, uh, air louvers. Uh, we'll keep moving. Uh, yeah, we'll go to our water systems, piping. Um, let's see, this is our incoming water pipe. Um, actually, it's a valve that's inside the, the basement. Um, on the other side of this valve, I've replaced the, the piping going all the way up to the um, wells, which are, I don't know if you all know, but they're about a hundred yards or they're about the way. So all that piping has been replaced with PVC, polyvinyl chloride. But on the back side, it's connected to this, what appears to be brass valve, which is connected to our water system through copper and, <clears throat> and lead soldered pipes. Um, These, this, this is a, an instance where it shows where, you know, we can't fix this. This goes into a, an area, into a ceiling that I couldn't tell you um, what's above. I, I couldn't, and I hope and pray when I go to bed at night that these things don't leak, because um, we'll have a real problem. Let's see. This school doesn't have any sump pumps other than that sewer ejector. It, 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 all, it does have an elevator, as do each of the elementary schools. This particular one is um, in better shape than any of the others because we spent $60,000 behind that, behind this panel. We, we converted all the old analog relays <clears throat> to digital, and now it's a much more reliable piece of equipment, but it is a I think it's called Murray or something. I'm not sure who makes it, but I'm trying to find prints for that. <laughs> they actually sell them on eBay, like $1,800 for a couple of prints for that elevator because you can't find them anymore. This is when you take and move the car up and open the door. What you're looking at is underneath the elevator. Um, you'll see we have a sump pump in the corner. We're required to do that. And to keep any of the water out. And you can see the high water mark where it's been in past times, um, although it's been some time ago. This particular one, this picture isn't doing a great job, but this is the main piston here for the, for the elevator. 
And right there where it meets the ground is a, is a seal, so it's a rubber seal. And, and that piston will go down into, that, into the casing below it. Well, the, the seal is bad, and that, that pail is there to drip any oils coming out of that seal into the pail, so it doesn't end up on the floor, and we don't end up pumping it outside. But that's, that's an upcoming job we're gonna have to do with schedule, and it's $5,000 you know, to replace the seal. Um, wastewater systems. So th these are systems taking the waste out of our bathrooms and our sinks and things. And th these are located mostly, well, well, there's a few places. There's some underneath this gym floor. There's some under the crawl spaces. This particular one's under the crawl space. And, and when I was under there, I see we got a little something. We didn't make it out, but we're going to have to go and take a look at it. Um, These are the, these things that I'm showing you are a little more than than our small maintenance department can handle. These are things that, that we need contractors, and, and one of the reasons we're kind of talking at the moment is, yeah, we could fix them one at a time, but then we end up with 1990s equipment that's even in better condition or back 1990s vintage. This is um, a floor drain that's up in. It's in the, when you go to the end of the milk hallway and you take a right, there's two bathrooms, one of which is still a bathroom, and the other one's an office, it's a special aid office. But this is in the floor of one, one, and it doesn't, we don't use it, we don't pour water down it, but it, it does need to be replaced. These are, these are drawing or pictures of, of various components of the system that are buried, some are buried in the floor, some are buried under, underneath the, the ground, some of which are in the crawl space. Um, you know, I can only assess the condition of those that I can see. Okay, our septic tanks. So those lines bring our waste outside. And um, that's a picture of one of the septic tanks. The playground is here and we're looking across. So. There's, there's actually a line in, in this gym running from the back. So there's two bathrooms. So actually, there's, three. there's one in this classroom, one in that classroom, and one in the nurse's room. And they tie together right across in front of that wall, underneath that backboard, and they go outside to this, to this spot here. And one of the problems with this one is that when it does get to single-digit temperatures, um, we end up pouring RV antifreeze in the septic lines to keep them from freezing. Um, there's, the point here is there's very, this building is, it's low to the ground and it doesn't provide much drainage to the tanks because there's not a lot of pitch. And back then they, they didn't pitch it a lot at all. It was an eighth inch to a foot. Today it's a quarter inch to a foot. And there's no pump, so it's just all gravity going down. And the many years of use have, um, created issues in the pipe. There's some dimpling going on. There may be some cracks here and there. We don't see any evidence in this school of that, but probably three to five times a year, I have Arco Rooter here rooting out the lines because, and that, that's, we'll get to that point, but one of, the, one of the issues is there's not a lot of water. So I can't change the fixtures in the, the toilet fixtures to low flow because I can't get the stuff from here to the tank without any water pushing through because it's so low. This, this is an air, air issue. So this particular school and the two other elementaries um, do not have um, filtered outside air. The only fresh air that comes into this school other than turning an air conditioner on is up on the roof, there are various um, exhaust fans, and those fans run all the time. And what they're doing is they're pulling air through the school. Each of the classrooms, this is, where am I? Oh, I'm not sure. I lose track of some um, It's, oh, okay. I'm through here. So this is at the top of the stairs, I think, on the right. So in the ceiling, there's a grate. And, and if you calculate that, that's 100 CFM. So it'll take 100 cubic feet 
a minute of air through the grate. That room, if it were 20 by 30 and 10 foot tall, would be 6,000 cubic feet of air. So that thing will take 6,000 cubic feet an hour. So the air exchange in that room is one time an hour. And that's if the windows are. Because the only place for the fresh air to come is through the window. The, and these are, these are more of the same. They're, they're scattered throughout the building. This particular one is in, in the classroom next door. Um, we'll keep going. Restroom. So they're, they're, this is in a bathroom or a restroom around the corner of those are just picked up in the ceiling. And that window will never be. And just another, another classroom shot. Um, this is, oh, this is one of the classrooms right here. So that, that mezzanine is forcing air through a series of ducts that are lying in this chase here through that room and into the next room. Um, and this is all asbestos. And, and when I talk about asbestos, you know, um, I can't say that, uh, well, it's always dangerous, but it's managed. Um, we, as a school system, are required to manage our asbestos, the floors that we're on, the glue that's gluing them down, many of the ceiling materials and things, by keeping them whole as opposed to broken and brittle or, 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 uh, or damaged. Um, that's when it would become dangerous because at that point it become airborne. However, what the problem with the asbestos isn't necessarily the fact that it's there, it's the fact that it prevents us from doing further improvement. This particular school doesn't have a major issue. So in other words, um, the other two schools, many of the classrooms and the hallways and various spaces <laughs> have the asbestos tile where they were carpeted over. This school doesn't seem to, I haven't run into that here because the old, the old section of the school, the, the wooden floors, I don't think were ever tiled. They just, they always were either wood or they were carpeted. Um, these, I believe, these are mostly carpeted. However, they have a small strip of tile. So I could probably change the carpets in this school easier than I can in others. But what I'm trying to say is that it just, it's, it's a, it's an obstacle to us moving forward to make further improvement. Um, electrical switchgear. This school is not in bad shape. It's got a, a, a it was, this was installed in 1990, um, and it's in pretty decent shape. The only issue with it, and I'll show it to you in another picture, is where the power comes in. It's leaking. Well, the other problem with this picture is that we don't have any place to put anything in, so we store things in places we shouldn't. Um, so many of the electrical end use devices, the plugs and outlets throughout the school are, are lacking in the locations where they need to be. Mostly if, if you all have an old house, then you got the same problem. Um, we have the same problem here. Many of them are, they meet code in, in their, in theory, but there's just not enough of them and there's no reason to have, this, this is another, in another um, type of strip. This this strip um, runs through that class and into another class. It's just an, an opportunity to try to provide more power. And it's 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 a good old. Um, the lighting fixtures in here. I I I started changing the district's lights over to to LED a little at, at a time. The board was uh, friendly enough to to pay and you taxpayers also to, to convert them. One of the problems in places like this is that um, this is a pendant light. It, it, I, could, I could take the bulbs out and put LED bulbs in, but I'd like to change the fixture and I can't because of the hazards that are up top there. Um, it's, not, it's not easily done. The types of people that I have to get here are, are people who are uh, abatement as opposed to just electrical contract. This is more of the same, and the same thing is here. You know, they, like I said, these are asbestos tiles. They are managed. They're all one piece. They're not dangerous in the way they are. But it prevents us from 
taken all this down and trying to replace it. Uh, and you notice that many of the many of the um, uh, wiring, whether it be wife, uh, Wi-Fi data wiring or electrical wiring, we're surface mounting because we can't get behind things. We don't want to get behind things, so we don't disturb them. Um, you, I make a, a few, you can read through my, my there, there's a few uh, additional, but when it comes to cooling, we, I said we have air conditioners, window shakers in various rooms. There are rooms in the school that don't have any. And this, this is one, this is a special, I believe it's a special. It's, school it's, it's a consulate. <laughs> okay. I call everything that's, that I don't know in a classroom as a special. Like, it's been used as a speech room, oh. school room, and uh, counseling. Well, this particular room, notice that, that that's the only way to get fresh air into this room is to get up on something and try to open the room. That, oh, by the way, you could tell that. So, so that that um, that drain we saw down below that was rusted beyond recognition, it, it's underneath this carpet here. It's no longer bringing any water anywhere. So, um, let's see where we go. Oh, this is interesting. This this is a restroom at the far end of the older building. Um, you know, pretty decent room. Again, the window is the only means of fresh air, and that that duct would pull air if the window were open. You know, we've got some heat down in there. That, that's the IT room, though. Uh, yeah, intervention out there this year. I mean, hey, it works. We make it work. That's the, we, we've made it work every um, The structure of the building and the site, um, this particular building and, and the WPS aren't fenced in. And you know, as facility director, I'm required to be in charge of the buildings and grounds. So I, I bring this to your attention because it, it is part of my purview. Um, traffic patterns in each of our schools, and, and you're probably familiar, our buses are crossing our parents. Uh, we do a good job of trying to keep them away, but the fact is there's only one way in and one way out. So let's see, and, and vulnerability is, a, is an issue. And where are we now? Um, okay, so this, is, this one baffles me. So we painted that gray, and, and it painted. It seemed to have washed away. The, the original color turned pink. Uh, I can't figure that out. I'm going to paint it again this summer. Um, but the, the picture is here because um, right here on the edge, of these stairs, you can see the remnants of something. Well, all the schools had a, a steel bull nose edge, uh, just an angle across there that's come loose and we had to remove it. And in, in removing it, all we could do was try to patch it with concrete and then paint over it. Many of the schools have the same condition. Yeah. I, I believe that those were granite at one time, like the like the fairgrounds said, I don't know what happened, why they got removed. The fairgrounds end is still. So many of these stairs, and this, this school doesn't have a lot of this, but um, the others quite often are rusty. And, and I can't get in there in the concrete to fix those rails. Um, I was telling the last group that when it comes to the stairs, like WP, I have $6,000 into the set going into the central office or between the school and the central office and almost 10 in the main stairs. And, and it's year after year, I'm chipping away like a dentist trying to fix it and patch it, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there, two thousand there. We wouldn't do that at home. We, we'd fix it, we'd replace it. And, and ice, you know, ice treatments have broken a lot of the, the concrete, and, and, the, and you don't have a lot of concrete blocks here. Um, there's some crawl space pictures, and I, we saw a couple of those already. Um, this is this is just, there's two major crawl spaces. This is showing you the equipment. Now, I inherited this. I haven't removed anything out of here. It's been here since I got it. All I do is repair everything you see. Um, previous people have done this. 
but you see our gauge that's running through here. You know, these, these are some of some ways pipes. There's hot water in, in, in these systems here, and then there's probably fresh water in the ones that are going up there. And just, that's a different view of a different portion. Of it. And you can see the myriad of, of various you know, pipes going in different directions that, that we're trying to keep our fingers in to keep them from leaking. <coughs> um, architecturally, uh, many of this particular building, so yeah, I hit the storage one, I forget what that one is. Oh. Okay, so many of the features in this building, however nice they are, are difficult to deal with. Like, I, I have a hard time walking into a room like this and not re-sanding and resealing something like that. I don't want to paint over that. If I paint over that, every year we're going to be painting over it. So I never got the opportunity to sand and seal and all that, um, but here we go. We're living with what has been put there in the past for storage. Notice. <laughs> Here you go. Notice, notice the great right underneath it. That's the room air. Our restroom fixtures. And I, I, I hit on this a little bit earlier. So one, a couple things about the restrooms here. These, you know, our friends who are disabled couldn't use these restrooms. This school has one The two restrooms downstairs are handicapped accessible. But to get there, you need to get into the elevator to go down. So none of the none of the restrooms on this level are accessible for the handicapped. The other issue with that one is that one's right in that room over there. And um, it got, I need to flush more water down that to keep everything moving, because that's the pipe that always gets flushed. And these are the sinks in, in one of the, um, the boys' restroom around the corner. The, the Russian, interesting enough, the Russian is big. And it has the space to create a, a uh, ground level ADA access, but they didn't. Or in the past, they didn't. You know, this, this toilet is just much like the one I just showed you. The sinks are not accessible. And around the corner are the urinals. Um, they had an opportunity, but didn't. I'm not sure why. And there's my low flow. You know, I'd love to put low flow toilets in the place and save some energy and, and reduce the water. It's, this is actually the nurse's office. And um, you know, it, it'd be pretty difficult for anybody with a disability to go in there. And by the way, that tile on that floor is, is, is asbestos, uh, well, the grout holding the tile. Um, let's talk about our waistline. Oh, here's a couple more pictures of some of the, now these are things that I, I you know, these are gonna be difficult if they go bad on me uh, to fix, fix. This is actually in the boiler room and it's servicing the uh, restrooms above. Um, our windows, you, you know, it, architecturally, it, it, it's a very pleasing building. I love the look of the, older building, but oh, just these aren't that. These are in here. Those, so to get fresh air, the teachers, you know, get the custodian to, to open the windows. And I don't know if you drive by here a lot, I do. And, and it really, it kind of angers me a little. And when they're not around, I come in here and shut the window. Because they'll leave them open because it's so difficult to get it open and close. Um, this this is this one's interesting. So I was saying, as architecturally pleasing as that building is, these windows are large. And and when I was walking around with Ben and he was taking pictures, I noticed this note, and the note, and it's a bad picture, but it says, "Please do not, please do not close this window entirely." <laughs> so whoever is in this room apparently is having a difficult time getting over this and getting up to to open or close that window. In this room, if I remember right, in the far end, there was an air conditioner. And um, I suspect this was, the, and then, oh, this is where the doors are in the middle. Yeah. So this is the only window available right here. I haven't even said anything about the shades of 
chords and all that being big. That, that's something I can do. And here's a picture of the large. That's a different one. <laughs> so you know better than that. To me, to me, it's a building that I take care of to you in certain spaces. You know. So that's, that's why I don't know what the name is. <clears throat> The, the, the doors here have mortise locks on them, which are really great. Um, but like I told the, the group before, that's Corbin Russell. Um, it's probably, oh, well, it's 50s vintage, 50, late 50s vintage. I'm 65 and I watched that company burn down when I was like nine years old. I lived in the grid. My grandfather loved going to flyers. He loved racing, he loved wrestling, he loved flyers. Darn, there's flyers, go see it. <laughs> and it was a huge six story building in the middle of town. It was quick, it was cooked now. But um, they're, they're in good shape, they work, but they're old. And, and we're spending, Nicole, I'll tell you, was, I spent a fortune on lots around the district. <laughs> and it's because my friend Mary here, not only Mary, but the board and all of you, just, Require safety, you know. And every door, every time. <laughs> I love Mary. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that in my sleep. <laughs> this is one of my pet peeves. You'll find it in, in, in each of the classrooms mm -hmm. throughout the district when I first saw this. So, the reason you're seeing, the reason this is here is because the green board back there is stuck to the wall with an asbestos laden adhesive. And so at some point in time, you know, the decision was made like others to carpet over it, or in this case, put a whiteboard on, and now we've got our new technology over the top. And then we, we plug it into our, our, our you know, high power electrical system. And, and there's more pictures of, of those blackboards. They're in every room throughout the whole thing. You know. and, and we just we took them. Um, Dr. Gaza, when he left well, the IT department and Nicole was going to um, fund a, a smart board replacement last summer in the, in the high school. And Dr. Gaza says, Dad, why are these like this? <laughs> you know, and so we, we, up in the high school, what we found was we didn't have a lot of asbestos behind it, but they still put smart boards over the old boards. So we were able to actually, because they were all screwed on, we were able to take them all off. So we took some 30 of them off there. But I can't take, we can't take these out without an, ab an abatement project. And an abatement project is a project where they seal the room off, they, they put fans in to pressurize it, another fan outside to pull and filter whatever's coming out of the room, where guys go inside in suits and air and respirators and when they, exit the room, they go through a shower to clean them before they can take all that off. Um, the, the one features of the exterior here, as you know, we painted this school last summer. Um, and and it, it, it breaks my heart because we're just cleaning it and painting it over and over. There's lead paint under the bottom layers of these things. And, and the EPA has a rule that that won't allow us to, to scrape or sand more than 20 square feet on an exterior or six square feet on an interior space. And we have lead paint on the interiors too. Due to the age of the building and its construction, it's been sealed by many other layers of paint. But to, to fix these things, um, you're gonna need to sand and scrape these. And they're, they're beautiful. You know, they're just, just gorgeous um, parts of architecture. It, it, a further picture is going to show the base of this one. Um, oh, this, is a, this is one of the half window. I was trying to find, I, done, I was trying to find one that we could see, and, and we can't quite get to this, but you know that we've changed a lot of windows in the school, but we didn't change these, these architectural design windows at the time. I wasn't involved in, in the, in, well, I was involved only in the far end of it. When I got here, the, the project was had been priced and it had been pushed through. They were just waiting for final approval and then funding. So I oversaw the first plot of 2013 
a project to upgrade these windows. They didn't choose to do the, let's see, there's one, two, there's, I think there's three of these. But they, <coughs> they need to be done. You know, if we want to save them, we need to do um, oh, This is the base of that column. When, at the time, in 2013, what we did do was cut off some rotted wood and added this component that's composite material, and then we just painted it. And, and you know, it's, 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 it was beautifully made. I'm, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if the, uh, <laughs> so I'm wondering if Captain Burnham, when he built this, these guys or people went over and built his ship, or if it was the other way around. Because the building's got really great bones. <laughs> and and he, I understand he's a very successful captain, so I suspect he had a doggone good ship, you know, or more. Or more. Um, what we're looking at here is the total lack of insulation. You know, the, the building has zero, I, I shouldn't say zero, because it doesn't. This does provide some semblance of insulation. And, and there, I'm not entirely positive, but this may be a half inch, you know, of, of aluminum with sandwich um, styrofoam in between. It, it may, but the energy conservation just isn't here. Um, now I get to these are the hazards, and we've talked about them a little bit all along the way, and, and especially this is one of them. Um, here, this is a document. That is in the front offices of each of our schools. We are required to, like I said, manage all the asbestos in, 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 the, in the facilities. And we have a third party we pay to come in every six months and then again every three years. So every six months, a third party comes in and pulls this binder out from the front and makes sure that there's been no changes to each of these items that we're looking at. So if, if they find something that's dangerous, I get a report saying, Don, you need to take care of this immediately. Um, and that, that exists up in the front of each of us. This is page two of the same document. Now that book also has, as they've gone through and tested these pieces of equipment and components, they've um, identified a number of pieces that are not, not, not as much. So, you know, they add that to the binder also, and I, I didn't show So here's a here's an example of it, like I spoke <coughs> about in the past. The tile, you know, we the, the lights we, we, the lights are fixed to the to the ceiling. The ceiling is 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 an asbestos component and it's glued up with an asbestos adhesive. That's uh, that's the yeah, old IT room. Um, the next issue is lead paint, and you talked about that. It's it's encapsulated under most of all of the walls, and, and this is this is one of them. You know, so under the bottom layers of that, you'll find lead paint. And again, it's a common practice to seal it. It's seal it with new paints. It's dust. This this was Ben and I were down in the crawl space, and I had my flashlight on, and I just showed you a picture of the dust. You know, we wear a respirator. Dust. I mean, we did disturb it, and that's probably why it's dusty. The fact is, it's there, and the, the floors are the floors are dirt. Notice, well, the, this one doesn't have it. The, this this area here, the, there's a little water that's got in there. But I see, oh, you know what? That's the backside of the elevator. So occasionally, the elevator gets water in it. That's what the pump is. Um, lead and copper, and um, I started by saying that, that what, what the issue is, is trying to improve the indoor air quality, the water quality, the comforts um, for the occupants, the access for the ADA, the mechanical equipment, and then the energy efficiency. Well, that, um, that uh, um, what was it, the, the lead copper, our, are, we meet all the state and, and federal thresholds, but I'd be lying to you if it was zero, and it's not. Um, and the only reason it's not is because of the copper and the lead soldered joints. They're, 
distribute the water throughout the school. Like I said, I, I change the exterior pipe of plastic, but once it hits inside, that needs some up in order to get to none. And, and quite frankly, lead is one of those things that we all know, and we don't need the EPA to tell us zero. It, it, anything above zero is too much. Um, on the horizons, there, there are HVAC, um, well, COVID taught us that, that we need fresh air. And the schools, as I, I show you, only get that through opening the window. It's not filtered, it's not tempered, so in, in a lot of places, not cooled, so it's not tempered. Um, and it's not distributed everywhere. Um, soon, I don't, well, the present equipment won't do what the future is. And soon the future is going to point to us and say, in the form of legislation, that uh, we need to upgrade these systems. And not only upgrade them, but maybe even maintain uh, a, a standard temperature between 68 and 80 degrees in all the schools. Although they, they're considering other standards for a gym. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, this is a gym, a cat, and an auditorium. So I'm not sure how they would do that. <laughs> you know, what standard would we apply to this, this one thing? Um, it, they, they would treat gyms differently because people are typically breaking a sweat. Um, but the fact is, standards are coming. The, and then down below here is the, the water, the EPA. And, and right now, I was, on a, I was on a phone call during the summer back in August, and, and I'm trying to, to stay on top of whatever the EPA is trying to put out there to, so that my friend Nicole knows that well, this is how much money we need down there. Um, and so I was on, on this call about letting copper in, in, in the pipes. And, and it, was a, it was an entire um, US call. Every large city, Phoenix, Boston, New York, they were all on this Zoom. And I'm listening to these large cities try to get their hands and heads around how they're going to do this. Because many of them are, have ancient 100-year-old piping underground. Some of it is lead. Our schools do not have any, I have not seen any lead piping. I have not, and I don't, I don't see it in our test for you. But the point of this is that was the start of inventories. So every public water supply throughout the country is going to be required to inventory their systems to identify if there are any lead products in it. They go so far as to include brass and bronze because there's a component of lead in each of those two. So at some point, very near in the future, I'm going to have to inventory the entire system. Now, the whole point of that is standards will come behind it. Right now, the standard is zero. However, there is a threshold. That threshold will go away at some point. So now we're going to open it up for questions, conversation, dialogue. Yes. Can you explain who you are again, how long you've been with the region, work background, licensing, stuff like that? I mean, how did you become the buildings and ground okay. head? No problem. Um, so, <clears throat> I worked for a corporate entity for 30 years as their um, project engineer and worked my way for the last eight of those years to be their facility director. Um, I went around the country and some parts of the world building buildings for them, moving equipment for them, and inspecting and you know, adding manufacturing spaces. When I I had, a, I had a contract with them where my job was going to end in 2009. I knew that eight years prior. So I, I wanted to have 30 years. And to get 30 years, everybody was jumping ship. I says, look, I'll stay here till the end. I'll take the flag down when I'm done. And um, that got me to 30 years. But when I left there, I could have walked away. But I didn't. A friend of mine says, Don, you know what? You'd, you'd be great for these facilities, these school facilities. So within three months, one came up. It was this one. I went to the interview, and I ended up getting the job. 
there were 45 people, they said, that had come. They interviewed 50, well, they got 45 apps, they interviewed 15 people. I am not a degreed engineer. I am, I do have a business degree, but I am not a degreed engineer. What, what year I, I've been was doing that? this for 45 years now. So I've been with this district since 2009. Um, I'm gonna tell you something, when I, when I came to take this job, it, it paid far less than what I had been making. And when I went home and told my wife that, she's like, Don, they need you. And you know what? I like doing this stuff. Um, I do lay awake at night stressed, but I'm gonna tell you, and I told Dr. Goslin that, I feel like I'm the only one who goes home stressed about the district problems. Because if that boiler goes down or that roof goes down, these, these kids don't have a place to come to school, you know? So the reason I'm trying to to, to, to show you all of these things is just for that reason. It's just to, to, to meet the standards in the future beyond where we are today. We're okay, we're safe today and all that, but you know what? I don't know how long that's gonna last. And, and that's what driving me to, to, to say, this is not comfortable for me, to be really honest with you. I, I'm, I'm not a public speaker. I, I, I'm, Mark forced me to do this. <laughs> it's part of my job. But, but I don't think okay, that. I was just no, curious as to your background. Because you, you made comments about things and there's not a lot of dialogue like saying there may be glue behind a board, but did anyone ever take a board off to yeah. know if there's asbestos glue behind oh, yeah. that? Oh, yeah. So that, that's odd. Like yeah. it's just, there's like missing components and I know we have a very short period of time. Yeah. Right. So it's, 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 they're there and we think there's some behind them, but have that has one been that flawed. third party tests all those okay. components and and you know what you're not wrong i had to make a choice when i did this i, I could bring the reports and you know my office is full of them yeah you know and, and and i didn't want to do that you know i know every inch of this place to be really honest with you and i know where your problems are and where they're not and and i care and that's that's all it comes down to you know? i'm sorry yes Thank you for putting this all together. Um, I guess this is great information to have. We have some more conversations that are gonna be had. What's the ask at this point? What is this leading you towards? If you had to give us kind of a, a ballpark, like what, what's the ask? Well, I think what we're asking is for parents, for the taxpayers, the community to tell us what you wanna see for your schools, right? We wanna be honest, we wanna be transparent. We have schools that need significant investment, right? So that's gonna mean raising taxes to address some of these issues, right? Maybe having to bond some of these projects. They're big, right? We've picked the low-hanging fruit. The stuff that's easy to get to, where we didn't have to go for asbestos floors and asbestos walls, we've been going through and maintaining that. You walk around the buildings, you can see that, you can feel that. Now we're getting to the point where we have some work to do on major systems that's expensive. So the ask is going to be, we're going to have to do something to invest in our elementary school. We put a lot of money into the secondary space, Chapag is gorgeous, and now we're looking at the elementaries and saying, what do we need to do to make sure that we have great learning spaces for our kids and for our teachers at this level? So that's the ask, right? And so we're trying to think about this through a couple different lenses. So one lens is the buildings themselves, right? So there's some issues. Another one is how do they work for us as instructional spaces? Um, how do they work in terms of meeting safety and security uh, concerns that unfortunately we do face in the country today and that we build buildings in very specific ways today um, to make them as safe as possible. Uh, and then also, how do we look at our program overall and say, what are the other enrichments or things that would be nice to have? You know, I've heard parents say, we want to have a Spanish program, right? I need some more classroom rooms for that or spaces for those kind of things. Um, I don't think I've been in the building where someone has said to me, hey, Dr. Dawson, it'd be kind of nice if we get a hot lunch. You know, that to me is a no brainer. So yeah, I, I think that would be nice to be able to offer hot lunch to kids too. Um, but to bring our kitchens up to um, a state where we can serve food in a healthy, safe way, um, again, we need to do some work and some investment in those. Um, we can't even prepare food in spaces where we don't even have appliances, right? So if we don't have a stove, um, that really gets in the way of us trying to put out hot lunch, right? So um, these are improvements that I'm asking the community, what is it that you want to see in your schools? You know, you own these things. Um, your kids go to these schools. Um, and so we need to hear from people what they want. Um, I've heard rumors, I've heard stories, I've heard hearsay, um, but I wanna hear from parents, what is it that you want moving forward? Um, and how can I as a superintendent, how can I get our board behind 
those initiatives so that we're being as responsive to serving the community and delivering on the promise that you know you want for your kids. So that's the answer. Sure. Um, so what exactly is like hypothetically whether I mean I don't know where exactly you're going with this, but either way. <laughs> Um, I mean, I can tell you what my opinion is, but again, um, but I'm curious, uh, what is the time frame? Like, when will this all happen? Like, whether you fix these schools, you make a new school, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so um, we're right now in the process of building the budget for the coming year. Um, and we need to put together, you know, based on the feedback that we get from families as we, you know, go through this exercise, um, what our priorities should be and where do we want to start, you know, putting together financial plans to support those efforts, right? Um, I think you saw, you know, uh, here, but in our other two schools, if you um, haven't seen, you can go online and see the presentations there. Uh, there's a lot of facilities work, um, particularly on the big expensive systems. And so that's where, you know, we're going to have to invest some, <coughs> some money in, in the near future. Um, and it's hard because you can't just fix one component. A lot of these things are designed to work together, right? So our electrical and our plumbing work it, in tandem. So there's a synergistic effect that we want to take advantage of as we think about how would we you know, redesign those systems or upgrade those systems. Uh, and then also, what impact is it going to have on teaching and learning, making sure that you know we have the things that we need in our classrooms to continue to offer the best education. So that's kind of what we're in right now. It's the information gathering stage of putting together a comprehensive plan of where do we want to go moving forward. So we're really at the front end of that. Um, so you know, what's next, I think, is again, having these conversations, learning together, and then saying, okay, after all of this, what do we want to see as a part of a plan moving forward? And then we'll start putting those pieces together. Yes. Um, just as a point of reference, um, between 1990 and today, was a presentation like this done in between? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there was, right? Because in one of the opening slides, there was a, Architect study was commissioned in 2002. So at some point around 2002, um, people did take a look at um, some of the capital needs that needed to be addressed at that point. Uh, I know that one for a fact. There might be some other folks in here who have a longer um, historical recollection, but that's one that I know for a fact that uh, was done. Oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, my name is Fred Stern, I'm a Bridgewater resident. My kid went through Burnham, all the way through Chippewa. Um, I was on the Board of Ed in 2002. That was when we started looking at, should we redo the buildings or should we build a consolidated school? That brought up all kinds of issues. <laughs> Don't wanna go back there, but uh, we did do intense uh, looks at all the buildings and we had plans for all the buildings in terms of what needed to be repaired, what needed to be replaced. Do we knock down the school? Do we build a consolidated school? We had all that information. We have looked at these schools then and then they looked at them again uh, some years later, about five years later, I was off the board now. Uh, and we did it all over again. So they've looked at these many times. They've spent a lot of money not doing any of the things we talked about. <laughs> okay, in general, in terms of replacing the schools or building a new school or whatever. Uh, so this, there's been a lot of work done to make it as good as we can. This, this gym here, I don't know how many people are old enough, but that wall, and you probably don't know, this, that wall was all glass. And whenever the wind blew, the wall went like this. They were literally afraid that whole thing was going to come down on the kids. So this is the new one. Okay. <clears throat> when you play, when you have gym in here, this gym is so small, particularly if you have, like I used to coach basketball in here for some of the younger kids. Okay. They're hitting the stage. They're hitting the walls. They're hitting the back walls. It's dangerous. Okay. And when one of the plans for the school was they're going to do everything for the rest of the school and leave this gym alone. And I said, no, you can't do that. It's not safe. All right? But all this has been looked at. So now the question that the good doctor here has is, what do you want? 
but also, sorry, a second part to my question would be, I mean, if we have to bring certain things up to code, like the legalities behind that, there is a time frame that we have to work with it. So what are the first things that have to be brought up to code by when? And that would be the timeline that we would be working with now. I mean, the only thing that needs to be brought to code would be um, entrances and egresses, right? Um, that's some of that concrete work that are definitely trip and fall hazards. Um, many of our buildings uh, are difficult for students with disabilities to navigate, uh, whether that's uh, classroom spaces, supplemental learning spaces, or particularly restrooms. And so those would be things that we would want to definitely move on immediately. Even as we think about what some of our long-term solutions might be, we're still going to go ahead and, and fix and make improvements. I mean, kids go to school here in real time, so we can't just say, oh, we're just going to you know, put this off for some other day. Um, but those would be the immediate fixes that we would have to do to make sure that not only our students, right, but also visitors and staff. We also have staff who um, maybe come to work in a wheelchair, and they would need to be able to also navigate our spaces. Um, and I think there's also another you know, element of this. If we can do better for people than saying, oh, non-disabled folks can just walk down the hall and use the restroom, but if you're disabled, you have to go up and down elevators and you know take all this time away from class and that type of thing. So um, you know those would be I think some of the um, immediate concerns to make sure that we're, we're meeting code. Also making sure that some of our smaller you know but still <coughs> compliant things are being addressed, like our our rails the right size, right? You know, we'll be able to pass the sphere of a certain size through those types of things. So we'll have to go through and make those types of code corrections um, in the very near term as we also think about what do we do in the next term. Like Connecticut State Requirements. Uh, correct. Sorry. Connecticut and federal. Yes. Um, I think I'm one of several people who feel strongly about having a school within a town, like keeping a, t a school for each town. You know, I won't speak for everyone, but I, I know some of the people I've spoken to feel strongly about that. Now, I know the, the thought is floating around out there that it might be more practical to build one school for all three towns, which, of course, has been discussed before. Brookfield, for example, just built a $78 million school. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that was the price tag on that. And it's very elaborate and um, sort of high tech, I believe. All their information's on the um, town website. But the joke in town there is we could have had three schools for the price of this really fancy school. So I guess my thought is like, I love the look of this school. I love the location of it. I know there are some safety concerns, but maybe those could be dealt with um, if the school were to just get renovated. Is it even conceivable that a school like this could be, if you found some way to send the kids elsewhere for a year to you know, split them between the two other schools. Logistically, I don't understand how that would work. But let's just say you could do that. Is there a way to gut, renovate a school like this and put it back together with better systems and insulation and lead-free and asbestos-free and um, maybe reconfigure the spaces to make them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's too early to, to go to kind of a solutions phase of, of the process. But when we do, literally, yes, all all options are on the table, right? Um, and people will talk about, do we do exactly what you said? Do we build one school? Do we build two schools? Do we, you know, and all of those things will have to be vetted and considered and given careful consideration. Like, you know. Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's not start talking about consolidating. This town has been scarred, long history of I didn't say we're talking about consolidating. I said we're, we're just saying that we need to address our schools. We would be the only town in all of New England without a school in its border. We don't know the effects of uh, real estate values and who moves into a, a, a town without a school in its border. Well, that's we kind of why I asked my question, just, what's the solution then? If, if this school is to stay, which I would love to see it stay, like, just how, how can that happen in reality? Maybe we um, would have to make a plan to, you know, Temporarily house students at another school while the work goes on. That, that, that would be the plan. Right. You can also but do other phases. Are going to be doing this. It's not just these three towns, right? You have four months Sorry. every summer. You can phase each part of the building in sectors, and 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 then you know stop as it is. I mean, you don't have to tear it all apart in one year. Right. Slap it all back together. You know, the problem with Brookfield is they were over budget a year and a half behind, 
and they have a building now that is dilapidated up there that I've spoken to Tara multiple times about that they had five years to make a decision to do with the building and nobody can figure out what to do with it. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, but you can phase building processes like that. Obviously he'll tell you it's a nightmare, but it's not to say that you can't address certain aspects of the build at certain times. Start with the plumbing, then you start with the sewage systems and stuff like that. It can be done like that where you can use part of the building. It's not easy. Um, you know, Brookfield's not the only town with a new school, and there's a reason why we're seeing a lot of new schools going. They're all of the same vintage. There was a school boom in the 60s. They're all falling apart. So some districts choose to build new. Some, you know, have other, you know, partially build new, partially renovate. Um, I think that our district is being proactive in putting everything out there. I think this analysis was great. And I think, you know, if Don has a whole bunch of reports, we just need to look at all that data and come up with the plan. Um, so I think the proactiveness of this and understanding that we want, you know, a school in our town um, and looking at that as well in terms of information and data and what we can do, I think Together, we will come up with a plan that makes sense for everybody, but it's something that has to be done because obviously, I mean, Sherman's in a big mess too. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, we're not alone. <laughs> it's not unique. Um, but I think with the right process, we can have a successful outcome. Yeah, and just to piggyback off that, I thought at the last board of ed meeting when you were talking about looking at um, the architect's plans, one of the things that I thought was so great in terms of being proactive is that like you're not going at it alone. You went to another school recently, you're studying what they're doing, studying what their spaces are like. Every school building is like so old, they're all getting redone. I thought that was so interesting. The last school you went to, you said they were actually building the new school behind like, I don't know in terms of land here, like I don't even know what that looks like, but the new school is getting built behind the school that the kids were currently in and then it kind of seemed like they were going to like swap yep. at some point so the fact that you're studying i don't remember the town that school and other schools around connecticut that are in similar positions I, is is great because it's not it's not a unique situation to be in yeah. i think that the information you got before was great I, I obviously some of the security concerns and the hazards i think they need to be addressed um i know bethel just went through their big school renovations, they brought in mobile classrooms. They had mobile classrooms set up and they renovated the entire school. So there's a way to get around and doing stuff without necessarily needing to get rid of everything. I'm sorry, it seems like there's a lot of these systems that are on the brink of what seems like catastrophic failure. Um, has there been any recent competitive bids or monetary information gathering gone on so that we would have an idea of what we would be looking at? And also, as far as the fencing, I don't know if this is really relevant because I think everybody here is really just concerned about the school closing, but I think it would be beneficial to put some sort of herbaceous border up so that people driving past the school can't look back and see exactly what our kids are doing all the time. And I know people do that because I do that on my way home from reach and I can spot my son playing <laughs> in the back here. Um, and I just feel like that's a security concern. It's not everybody's just a crazy mom. There's other real crazy people that are yeah, and, and, you know, through this process, you know, as we start to think about, you know, what solutions we want to look at moving forward, that will be one of the things we'll have to look at. If the want to replace systems is getting, um, you know, estimates and putting that out for proposals, um, it's hard to do because you need to really define what you want to do, right? So you can't just say, hey, can you just come on and give us a cost and make cost to fix, you know, these pipes over here? Like, we have to have a very coherent plan and saying this is exactly what we want to do. We put it out for bid, we get the bids, we take a look at them. Um, we have to also then evaluate, you know, people that supply the bids, can they really do the job, right? And so this, these are not like a home, like these, these buildings are industrial buildings that require, you know, a certain level of, of proficiency and, and skill to be able to come in and do the, the work here. So um, that would be one of the things that we would do next is, is start to get some of those costs together. Um, you know, but again, we need to hear from you first what you want to do, and then we're happy to do the legwork and the research, you know, uh, plan forward. Just so you know, um, we're managing it right now. You know, we're fixing those things that need to be fixed. 
there are no catastrophic problems on the horizon that I'm hoping, right? But we're, we're trying to be proactive and make sure there are. This is one of those proactive times that, you know, it is, it is, it is life expectancy, it is beyond, and we are keeping it going, but we need to move some. Yeah. One of we're running into is we try to do that and kind of limp along right. is that it's getting harder and harder to source parts for some of our systems um, because they literally don't make them anymore. So that's something that then we have to you know do a little bit more creative engineering to you know fix some of these things. Um, you know, and we are reaching a point, you know, certainly at our elementary, but you know, even Chicago is one of our newer buildings. Um, you know, we had an issue this year where uh, we have a, a line that runs underneath the mall there um, that almost has no pitch to it, right? And so now we have a belly or a flat spot in that pipe. And so wastewater gets kind of hung up there, right? And so um, we have to do some work to try to rectify that with the close the bathrooms for a little bit while we worked on some of that. We had a flood that we gave me the clean and then deal with that. Um, so we're gonna try to, again, force, you know, jet some water through there or, um, you know, snake as far as we can go with the wind direction. But you know, those are the kinds of things that crop up unexpectedly. Yesterday morning we had, um, a heating failure at our central office, right, which is over by Washington, and so um, we have these unexpected, you know, occurrences that happen. Uh, luckily, we were able to get the heat restarted there, but um, you know, if that was a problem, we would have to again do some creative work to try to solve that in the meantime because <coughs> it is difficult, like I said, to source some of the components. Um, like I know the electrical panel over at Booth, for example, is you know, I don't know what year that was created, but. There's no way we'd be able to get parts of that. So that has to be a wholesale replacement, which isn't impossible, but again, it has to be done strategically. And, and you know, when kids are in the building, especially if we have to do some baby with parts, right? And so uh, those are the kinds of things that we try to balance. That's, that's the, like you just, that, that the abatement process for these projects. That's the, the logistic difficulty of the whole thing. Because if, if, you know, listen, I'm not one person afraid of asbestos. I'm the last person in the world afraid of asbestos. But I understand parents' concerns about it and doing this floor and how things have to really be sealed up. I've been a part of these processes before. And it's pretty intense. So that's why you, some of these processes need to be done if we're going to keep the building and renovate it to, you know, in phases, some of that abatement stuff can only happen in the summer. You, you can't even take the risk of doing it during the school year. Yeah, and, and again, as a government entity, you know, we're held strictly liable for the way that we do things. We have lots of rules and regulations, so I can't just go home downstairs with a garden sprayer, spray it, you know, put it yeah. in a garbage bag and throw it away. You know, we have inspections we have to go through, and, uh, you know, so it just, it's, it's harder, and, and it is painstaking to go through those processes. We'll have to do it, it's the right thing to do. Um, but again, we just have to be strategic around when we do those things, because it is going to be disruptive. And the state requires that no human under 18 years old be right. on the site at all. Right. So that's why anything that runs into what would test as positive as best, the building must be empty. I have a few questions. I first wanted to, uh, well, I guess, thank you for your presentation. But my first one is what is your budget for facilities? for Burnham, like last year and the year before, just like, so we understand like the baseline for what you've been using for our maintenance. Do you know off the top of your head, Nicole? I know that, I don't know if you know, right, for the penny with the ballpark. Yeah, I mean, yeah. anything to like 5,000, 10,000, I mean, it seems like that doesn't seem like that much. It's no, and then that's not right, right? I'm just curious what you're saying. Well, I mean, I can, the facilities budget for this year that we're in was 1.6 so I don't know the exact breakdown between the schools. Um, I still have that at my fingertips. Is that all four? That all four. Okay. That's hard because we so, kind of flex it based on what, what the needs are too, right? Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just was yeah. wondering if it was all four. Okay, that's helpful. So then my, my second question to you is, like, I understand that, like, the HVAC is a lot of, like, security. There's a lot of funding in the state of Connecticut right now to, like, put these in. So is all of that being factored into your budgeting and in terms of, like, solutions that we would be looking at in the timeline? Sure, so once we have, you know, the feedback of what we want to do moving forward, we will go after all grant monies that are available from um, all places. So, you know, whether that's the Connecticut, whether that's the federal government, um, you know, we'll be looking to um, try to use all of that. You have to be careful because some of that comes with, um, 
rules and, and lockouts from other things, and so you have to just be careful about that. Sometimes it sounds, oh, it's all this free money, but there's a lot of catches uh, and a lot of snags that aren't always apparent, you know, when you hit, read, like, the flashy headline of the newspaper, you know, and so we just want to make sure that, you know, if we want to use that, we're using it in the best possible way, given the maximum, you know, um, return on investment when we take advantage of those dollars. Yeah, and for, for most of our grant, for most of the school construction grants that we would be able to apply for, our reimbursement rate is 32 point, it, it fluctuates from year to year, but this year it's 32.86%. So if you were to seek those construction funds, you and your project were two million, the grant would be for 32.86% of that. So the rest would either have to be bonded or tax care blended. Um, those percentages are based on your, your individual towns and how the financial structure and ability to pay for towns. So where a town in a more urban area may be able to get 80 or 90% of their HVAC projects funded, mm -hmm. the best we can hope for is 32 or, 32 or 33%. Okay. We're trying to be careful though. There are a lot of sharks in this marketplace trying to go after those dollars. Again, I don't know, a dozen or more emails every day. Oh, there's this money for you know this safety thing, or this money you know to buy air purifiers. You're going to use the you know state grant to buy that. And once we do that, then when we want to build proper HVAC, we can't because I use our money on you know the silly you know air freshener thing. So you know these are areas where again we're, we're doing our due diligence and we're making sure that you know we're going after those monies when we need them for the right projects and not you know for these silly fixes along the way or you know just applying someone else's pockets. Can I ask uh, one question? Sure. Uh, prior, uh, well, prior, during COVID, uh, funding from the federal government went to every single state to do some HVAC work. Obviously, yeah, that, that was one possible use. Yeah. Okay. So what? So so, pretty much every school was supposed to get like I don't know some sort of HVAC upgrade, filtration systems. This school doesn't really have a real HVAC system, right? Basically, it's Correct. a very not good system. So what happens to like the funding of that for a school that couldn't use it? Like, did we use that money somewhere else? Did that money, so that's where I'm, I'm just, what, what, what was that money and where did that go? So I think there's, so there was a lot of money that they called COVID grants that came yeah. to the schools and there's a lot of different names from S or S or two, S or three. So you were given that money in percentages, again, based on your enrollment, based on your demographics. So I think our total HVAC grant, or, or I'm sorry, our total COVID grants over a three year span equaled about 580,000, and it was given to us in chunks. Okay. Um, we could have used that money for HVAC. That yeah. was one of the possible uses. We didn't use any of it for that. Okay. Um, we used it for, in the very first, part of COVID, we used it to keep our buildings open. We used it for um, PPE and extra staffing and making some of our spaces accessible so we could spread the kids out um, yeah. for outdoor tents. Um, and then as, a, as COVID kind of moved through, um, a lot of the money was geared more toward um, special programs for kids to help kids um, catch up with their reading. And, to deal with yeah, the so issues that came with COVID. That money over that three year period that we got, which was, was we were thankful for, it was $500,000. Yep. Those were the areas that we spent that money. Cool. Yes. I appreciate you saying, you know, you want to keep your options open and you're gathering kind of feedback from the community, but I think I speak for a lot of people in just saying that taking the idea of building a consolidated school should be taken off the table yeah. and we shouldn't waste any more time on that. People have spoken about that. We want a school here, whether it's a new school, I don't know, or renovated, but I would just encourage you all not to spend any more time on that. Yeah. Third. Yeah. <laughs> just, just to save some time. So narrow your <laughs> options. If you want to ask us for money, okay, let's see what you got. Yeah, Needs yeah. and wants to. Um, what's clean water? We need clean water. We need fresh air. Those things you can get us on board for pretty easily, I would say. But we want to school in town and don't spend any more time because we're going to vote it down. So I've just Again. share that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we'll give you money. <laughs> and I do think that the Bridgewater community, we all support our school. We all yeah. support our school here. And we're willing to come up with a solution mm -hmm. to fix our school or um, build a new one in its place or whatever that solution has to be yeah. to make it good for our children. But you can't replace 
the kids going to the library, walking over to the library every day, or the library staff picking them up at the end of the day and walking them over there, or the Halloween parade through town, or the senior citizens coming for the harvest gathering. Yeah. Being a mile from my house, we walk here sometimes when the weather's nice. Yeah. You know, I don't want my kid on the bus for 45 minutes. That is ridiculous and not something I would ever support. Ago. We wouldn't have moved here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it prevents And, and just others. the back that, like, and we're gonna fight for our school. So, yeah. I mean, I, there, you just said there's 54 Bridgewater students, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of parents here, and we're going to leave that fight. So, like, we know we're going to get the, the backers for it. Mm -hmm. You are not intimating that consolidating the schools is, is a thing. Right now, the, we're not rushing to any conclusions in any way, shape, or form. We're literally just looking at the problems going through and educating the community and getting feedback from, from the community. Okay. I've heard your feedback tonight, right? Um, is that, but yeah, that's a squishy answer. The, that is the, a squishy answer. Yeah, the decision kind of is surprising. I, th I think Mark needs to put all the, whatever, he needs to put all the cards on the table. I, I'm not, believe me, I don't want the school closed. I already told my wife it closes, we're gone. And we're taking our kids somewhere else. Like I won't be in this community without a school. But I'm not going to sit here and say that as your job. I mean, I think your job is, is this was great. I look forward to the next three. I think you need to continue to educate everybody and all the options on the table. I, I do agree you will never get Bridgewater to vote for it. So it's, I, you know, yeah, I agree you're wasting time. But everyone needs to see the options. And, and, and I'm willing to listen to them. But I would never change my vote. But I think it's only... That's got to be so far off uh, on the sidelines list to not be considered. It will not pass in Bridgewater. Yeah. It won't. It lost by 90%. Yep. And that wasn't long enough ago that people have forgotten how bad that was for the community. Yeah. You've reached 12 as a whole. So no one wants to go there. So let's just understand that it is, it's quite a list. It's very impressive, Don. Um, we gotta, we gotta figure out a way forward that it doesn't hurt so much, right? We're willing to throw some money at it. It clearly is gonna take a lot of money. We need something that's gonna make sense, right? Phase in over time. This is not, it doesn't look like a prioritized list per se. No, it's not prioritized at all. So prioritizing could be good and phasing in over a period of, you know, one year, two years, what would be reasonable and doable if you were gonna break this down Right, and, and take it in chunks. Yeah, right. And seeing that compared to the full renovation with, you know, outside yeah. classes. That, seeing two or three approaches of how we could renovate, I think are the best uses of time. Is that Absolutely. what you're saying? And I've heard from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Those two or three options. So, and, can I just ask about air conditioning? Um, in this day and age of climate change, okay, maybe air conditioning is, is necessary, but there are some hot days, but there aren't many. Air conditioning is really expensive for the amount of time to use it. It's not say. the air conditioning, so to speak. <coughs> it's the air quality. Air quality, <coughs> right. And, and about if, you, if you're going to upgrade the system to, to introduce good air quality throughout the entire school, and it's one of its parts, a modern system would include the heat, the uh, filtration, and air conditioning, and potentially humidity control. But those are all parts of a whole that can be removed one at a time if chosen. The fact is we need fresh air filtered and at least tempered to heat during the winter. That, that we need. And our system <coughs> won't provide that any part of it. Right? Mm. So, so if you're going to upgrade to something, more than likely it's going to include the, the, the air conditioning component. But it is a choice to make. I, I'm not making it at this point. I'm just telling you. And, and, and you're something. absolutely correct with the builder. Right? That is the right way. You, you can't renovate something half but You have to put the updated system in fully the way it's designed, or it just will never work correctly. And again, we're also getting some pressure from the state in terms of what that might look like, too, right? And so what well, we might sit here and say, oh, you know, we're fine not having air conditioning. We're also <coughs> getting asked by the state to provide, you know, assurances about our building temperatures, which again, 
as Don said earlier, is going to eventually uh, lead to uh, lengthy legislation about the acceptable building temperatures in our schools. Um, and that so, all rolls into ADA compliance, right? <laughs> like a special ed class who has to have air conditioning. Like, does that belong in Connecticut? It is in New York, yeah. right? And we don't, we have like a more of a mainstream program. So all the classrooms eventually have to be I will be air conditioned, right? I'm not one for like, I'm very happy with how AC, but there are some rooms in our building here that are like a greenhouse effect. Um, you can't learn. Our, our it's school too counselor hot. went home can't teach. with you know because she got so sick one day from the heat. We also have students who have special education needs that with vents and, and trachs like they need a certain temperature in their room. So it's it's really not about luxury. It's about all students being able to be in school and being in any classroom to learn without saying, well, you can only be in this room um, due to your health needs. So I do think there's multiple aspects to that. that you know, there are some in. kids that have seizures that are triggered by changes in temperatures. They may go from a warm space to a cool space, and you know, mm -hmm. now they're having a seizure as a result of that. So well, we're doing the way back system, that we just make sure to keep them off or some, some other solution where it would not be that. Yeah, um, so the, 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 the legislature has, has charged the director of the Department of Health with determining standards by July 24th, 2025. So those temperature ranges have not been published, but they have been put out, you know, oh, this is what we're considering, 68 to 80 degrees throughout the school, and then a potential difference for a gymnasium. So I'm just saying it's out there. Um, our systems are in, in need of upgrading. More than likely, they would include temperature control throughout the range, so that in the future, beyond whatever they come up with, 2025, we can. This, this school's been here since 1927. If you want to hear another hundred years, we may as well do what we can for the future. Yeah, I was actually going to say that. Like this is the opportunity since we've been here hundred years to make sure it can last another hundred um, at least. Going hand in hand with HVAC is the insulation issue. There's building envelope issues. The more insulation you have, the smaller of a mechanical system you need, the less it has to run. The more insulation you have, um, all the fresh air and humidity control will eliminate the amount of days you need air conditioning because it's removing humidity. So all of those things, even like this system is great, but it's like an R value of two when the standards are like 29. So there's a lot of energy lost and putting in a new system isn't just the solution, it's creating an envelope that's gonna make that efficient and help it last 100 years and be healthy and be less to operate as well. So that's why when it's, it's a big decision because it's not just the systems that are intertwined, it's actually the whole building itself. So. Having all the information is important to kind of come up with the plan and what areas need the most attention to make it kind of a solid, you know, tight building. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. I love listening. <laughs> so, so we should have lunch, so I want to thank everybody her. for coming out tonight. And um, our next one will be in January, focused on safety and security. So if you'd like to come out and have that conversation, we'd love to have you back. And we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.